deadly Israeli attack on Gaza, aid seekers draw condemnation. More than 40 dead in Bangladesh restaurant fire. Good afternoon and salam Malaysia Madani. This is World Today. I am Olivia Nicholas. Israeli forces in war on Gaza opened fire on Palestinians scrambling for food aid in a chaotic melee that the health ministry in the besieged territory said killed more than 100 people. The incident took place at Al Nabusi roundabout west of Gaza City in the northern part of the enclave. The Israeli military said a stampede occurred when thousands of desperate Gazans surrounded a convoy of 38 aid trucks, leading to dozens of deaths and injuries, including some who were run over by the lorries. An Israeli source, however, acknowledged troops had opened fire on the crowd, believing it posed a threat. The Gaza Health Ministry condemned what it called a massacre in Gaza City, in which at least 120 12 people were killed and more than 750 others wounded. Medical teams were unable to cope with the volume and severity of injuries from dozens of wounded people who arrived at Al Shifa Hospital. The incident adds to Palestinian death toll from the war, which the ministry earlier on Thursday said had topped 30,000 and dampens hopes a true deal between Israel and Hamas group could be just days away. In a related development, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemns the deadly aid delivery incident in northern Gaza. Desperate for food, thousands of Palestinians in Gaza City flocked to the aid distribution point, only to be met with lethal chaos, including live fire by Israeli troops. United Nations spokesman Stefan Jujaric said the incident needs to be investigated. He said there was no UN presence at the scene and reiterated the Secretary General's call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. The desperate civilians in Gaza need urgent help, including those in the besieged northern part of Gaza, where the United Nations has not been able to deliver aid for more than a week. The Secretary General reiterates his call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire and the unconditional release of all the hostages held in Gaza. He once again calls for urgent steps so that critical humanitarian aid can get into and across Gaza for all those who so desperately need it. Turkey also condemned Israel and accused it of another crime against humanity after the deaths of dozens of people in the scramble for food aid. The Turkish foreign ministry said the fact that Israel, which has condemned Gazans to famine, this time targets innocent civilians in a queue for humanitarian aid, is evidence that Israel aims consciously and collectively to destroy the Palestinian people. Colombia, meanwhile, is accusing Israel of genocide in Gaza, with leftist President Gustavo Petro suspending Israeli weapons purchases following the aid delivery tragedy in Gaza. Petro said the world must block Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Colombia's military and police have for decades used rifles, pistols and missiles from Israel. Israel is one of the main providers of weapons to the South American country's security forces, which are engaged in a decades-long conflict with leftist guerrillas, right-wing paramilitaries and drug cartels. Ukraine has identified 511 people suspected of war crimes since Russia's February 2022 invasion and has already handed down 81 convictions. Prosecutor General Andrei Kostin said this in Kiev when speaking at a war crimes conference alongside the chief prosecutors of Poland, Lithuania, Romania and the president of the EU justice arm Eurojust. 
Russia, however, has denied its troops commit war crimes, despite the conflict having killed thousands of Ukrainian civilians. The joint investigation team is conducting what Eurojust chief Ladislav Harman called the biggest investigation of war crimes in history. Commenting on the 81 convictions, Kostin acknowledged that most had been conducted with other suspects in custody. Kostin also said that discussions were taking place with more than 40 countries about the possibility of forming a war crimes tribunal. The first G20 finance ministers meeting of the year ended yesterday without a joint statement due to deep divisions over the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. Host country Brazil has an ambitious agenda to use the rotating G20 presidency to amplify the voice of the global south and tackle inequality and climate change. However, that was overshadowed by what it called an impasse over the ongoing conflicts at the two-day meeting in Sao Paulo. Finance Minister Fernando Haddad said that on financial issues, the G20 group, which represents 80 percent of the global economy, was unified. But since the meeting of the group's foreign ministers last week in Rio de Janeiro did not reach a joint statement that ended up contaminating the establishment of consensus at what Brazil had hoped would be a pure economic policy meeting. The Ukraine war has split the G20 with Western countries condemning the invasion and pouring military and financial aid into Ukraine. Russia, also a G20 member, has meanwhile courted support from fellow emerging powers such as Brazil, China and India. The group is also divided over Gaza, with the United States and Western allies reluctant to condemn Israel, even as non-Western members grow increasingly critical of a spiraling humanitarian crisis there. Countries pledge personnel for Haiti security mission. At least 44 people were killed and dozens injured after a fire blazed through a seven story building in an upscale neighborhood in the Bangladeshi capital of Dhaka. Bangladesh's Health Minister Samantha Lal Sen said at least 40 injured people were being treated in the city's main burn hospital. Fire Department official Mohammad Shihab said the blaze originated in a popular biryani restaurant in Dhaka Bailey Road at 9.50 p.m. local time on Thursday and quickly spread to the upper floors, trapping scores of people. He added that firefighters brought the blaze under control in two hours and they rescued 75 people alive. Fire officials said they suspected the inferno was caused by a gas cylinder blast at the restaurant. The government has ordered a probe into the incident. The Bailey Road building houses mainly restaurants, along with several clothing and mobile phone shops. Fires in apartment buildings and factory complexes are common in Bangladesh due to lax enforcement of safety rules. In July 2021, at least 52 people were killed, including many children, when a fire swept through a food processing factory. In February 2019, 70 people died when an inferno ripped through several darker apartment blocks. The Bahamas, Bangladesh, Barbados, Benin and Chad have formally notified the United Nations of their intent to contribute personnel to an international force to help high-tier national police fight armed gangs. The UN said contributions of $10.8 million have also been deposited into a trust fund to support the Multinational Security Support Commission. 
The UN added that further pledges of $78 million had also been made. We see, um, obviously, a very steep increase in uh, people on that flee their homes. They have to abandon everything and basically uh, either sleep on the street, be hosted by host communities, which already uh, have very scarce resources, as we can imagine, uh, but also be, uh, let's say, uh, camp camping out in, in, in schools, for example, right? So we have uh, now uh, 314,000 uh, displaced people in Haiti, which is uh, uh, quite a, a stark number. The United Nations Security Council authorized in October a foreign security mission to Haiti a year after the Caribbean country asked for help to fight violent gangs that have largely overrun its capital, Port-au-Prince. The response to Haiti's request for help was delayed due to a struggle to find a country willing to lead a security assistance mission. Lawmakers were sworn in during the first sitting of Pakistan's new parliament yesterday, three weeks after an election marred by widespread allegations of rigging. Pakistan's 8th of February poll took place with ex-Prime Minister Imran Khan jailed and barred from running. And his Pakistan Tehriki Insaf party targeted by a campaign of arrest and censorship. Khan's followers defied the crackdown to win more seats than any other party, but the military-backed Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz is set to shut them out of power with a coalition government. According to the coalition agreement, former Premier Sheba Sharif, who ousted Khan in a 2022 no-confidence vote, will be elected Prime Minister again by new lawmakers in the coming days. Cabinet positions have yet to be announced. Analysts regard the broad alliance as a shaky enterprise facing overlapping economic and security crises plaguing the nation of more than 240 million. Japan has eased visa regulations to expand the scope of foreign students allowed to stay on and find jobs in Japan in response to calls from business and academic circles. The Immigration Services Agency of Japan said the government will allow students who have completed studies at state-designated technical schools to work in fields that are not necessarily closely related to the areas they are majored in. The new measure is expected to increase the number of foreign students staying in Japan to work by around 3,000 a year. The agency also said that the state-designated technical schools will offer special programs including practical training at companies. In addition, the government also widened the scope of foreign students who can stay on in Japan to work under the designated activities visa, another residential status that allows employment in even wider areas. The visa was previously only for students who have graduated from universities or graduate schools. It now can be issued to students with high Japanese skills and educational achievements equivalent to a bachelor's degree, including those who have completed a four-year program at a designated technical school. Former Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, who made his political mark in the 1980s with the signing of a groundbreaking free trade agreement with the United States that later expanded to include Mexico, died on Thursday. He was 84. As one Brian Mulroney, Canada's last Cold War leader, opposed apartheid in South Africa and helped secure a landmark treaty on acid rain with Washington. But he brought in a consumption tax still reviled by Canadians to this day and his efforts to drive constitutional reform in large part to bring wayward Quebec into the fold ended in failure. A lawyer by training, Mulroney was ambitious and charming with a baritone voice. He was at ease in both of Canada's official languages, French and English. He served as Canadian Prime Minister from 1984 to 1993 and briefly came out of retirement to advise current Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on a revamped continental trade deal. 
fire crews fought to contain a deadly vile fire that has burned more than 404,600 hectares of grasslands, timber and residential areas in Texas' northern Panhandle region, making it the largest recorded fire in the state's history. According to the Texas A&M Forest Service, the blaze dubbed the Smokehouse Creek Fire had doubled in size since Wednesday and was 3% contained on Thursday morning. Firefighters used a brief lull in the strong winds that have swept the area to erect barriers and tackle hotspots of down trees and thick grass. Texas State Climatologist Director of Southern Regional Climate Center John Nielsen Gammon said the dry season conditions in West Texas were perfect for the wildfire. The Smokehouse Creek fire has now burned through an area larger than the state of Rhode Island. The number of structures destroyed and people evacuated is still unclear, but dozens of homes have been reportedly leveled. According to Texas A&M, the fire has so far killed one person. The victim was described by local media as an 83-year-old woman in Hutchinson County, northeast of Amarillo. The world likely notched its warmest February on record as spring-like conditions caused flowers to bloom early from Japan to Mexico, left ski slopes bored of snow in Europe and pushed temperatures to 38 degrees Celsius in Texas. While data has not been finalized, three scientists said that February is on track to have the highest global average temperature ever recorded for that month, thanks to climate change and the warming in the eastern Pacific Ocean known as El Nino. If confirmed, that would be the ninth consecutive month temperature record to be broken. In the northern hemisphere, the record temperatures mean that springtime comes earlier. People in Tokyo similarly snapped photos of pink cherry blossoms that bloomed about a month earlier than usual, while jacaranda trees that normally blossom in late March have filled Mexico City with purple buds since January. As snow melted in Europe this month, ski runs turned to mud and sat idle in Bosnia and Italy. Physicists at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, Anders Leberman, said the added heat from global warming wreaks havoc on global systems, helping melt glaciers in the poles and mountains, raising sea levels and driving extreme weather. Next up in sports, Williams brothers lead Balbao into Copa del Rey final. Kicking our sports segment with football, brothers Inaki and Nico Williams scored to help Athletic Balbao secure a 3-0 semi-final win over Atletico Madrid and a 4-0 aggregate victory that sent the Basque side into their third Copa del Rey final in the last five years. Ernesto Valverde's Bilbao team punished the visitors with clinical counter-attacks, playing with the advantage of having won the first leg 1-0 in Madrid. In need of a goal to stay alive and missing France forward Antion Griezmann due to an ankle injury, it was mission impossible for Atletico against opponents who had not dropped a point at home since October. The home side dominated from the start against a subdued Atletico with the jet heeled William Brothers a constant menace. They struck in the 13th minute when Nico burst up the left wing before crossing for his brother Naki, who unleashed a superb volley into the top corner. Bilbao attacked again in the 42nd minute, and Naki Williams set up Nico for a simple close range finish. Bilbao continued to dominate and Gorka Guruzeta wrapped up a 10th consecutive home win in all competitions for the Basque side from a rebound in the 61st minute. 
Al Nasser and Al Hazim played out a dramatic for all draw in the Saudi Pro League encounter early this morning. The result leaves Al Nasser second in the Saudi Pro League with 53 points in 22 matches, six behind Al Hilal, who have a game in hand, while Al Hazim moved up one spot off the bottom of the log into 17th place on goal difference, level on 15 points with Abha. Al Nasser without Cristiano Ronaldo, who was suspended for a match after appearing to make an obscene gesture towards rival fans following a 3-2 win over Al Shabab, went into the break 1-0 up through an Anderson Taliska penalty. Mayhem ensured in the second half with Al Hazim equalizing twice through Ahmad Al Mehmed and toes while Taliska had given the host a 2 1 advantage. Taliska then completed his hat trick in the 71st minute only for Faiz Salamani to draw the visitors' level again 13 minutes later. With Ronaldo watching on from the stands, Al Nasser thought they had won it with a late Sadio main penalty in stoppage time, but remarkably, Al Hazim clawed back a Another goal through Paolo Ricardo with essentially the last play. Former Slango FC manager Tan Cheng Ho has been appointed head coach of a Thai league club, Police Tiro FC. The club announced the appointment in a post on their official Facebook page yesterday. The post also said that Police Tero FC has moved current coach Yong Warawut Sri Maka to be technical president. The appointment and speculation that Cheng Ho would be coaching a club in the neighboring country following his departure from Selengo FC. Selengo FC had announced that they were starting the 2024 season of the Malaysia League with a new head coach after the club reached an agreement with the Kodahan to end his contract effectively immediately. Nizam Jamil will be stepping in as Selengo FC head coach temporarily pending the announcement of a new head coach. Since his appointment in September 2022, Cheng Ho has helped the Red Giants to become the runners-up of the Malaysia Cup in 2022 and also the Malaysia Super League last year, ensuring their automatic qualification to the AFC Champions League 2 for the 2024 2025 season. The coach who helped Switzerland to eliminate then world champion France at the last European Championship was hired to coach Algeria through qualifying for the 2026 World Cup. The Algeria Football Federation confirmed in a statement that Vladimir Petkovic will arrive in Algiers this weekend. Pat Kovic left Switzerland to coach French club Bordeaux but was fired during his first season in February 2022. Algeria is his first coaching job since then. The 60-year-old Sarajevo-born Pat Kovic replaces Jamel Belmadi, who resigned in January after Algeria failed to advance from the Africa Cup of Nations group stage. Algeria was the African champion in 2019. Algeria also failed to qualify for the past two World Cups, though leads a 16 qualifying group for the 2026 tournament after winning its first two games. The group winner will qualify to play in North America. Algeria resumes qualifying for 2026 in June with games at home to Guinea and away to Uganda. Pat Covid coached Switzerland to the 2018 World Cup where he drew with Brazil and beat Serbia in the group stage before losing in the round of 16 to Sweden. Pat Covid first games in charge will be friendlies at home against Bolivia on the 22nd of March and South Africa on the 26th of March. France star Paul Pogba has been given a four-year ban from football by Italy's anti-doping tribunal after testing positive for testosterone last August. A spokesman for his club Juventus said they had been notified of the decision against the 30-year-old World Cup winner who had been provisionally suspended in September.
Pogba announced he would appeal the ruling, which risked bringing a premature end to his career. Declaring the verdict was incorrect, he denied ever using performance-enhancing substances. The ban means Pogba will not be able to play again until the 2027-28 season, by which time he will be 34. Anti-doping prosecutors had called for the four-year ban to be imposed on the former Manchester United midfielder who tested positive following Juventus' opening match of the Italian Serie A season against Udinese on the 23rd of August last year, during which he was an unused substitute. A month later, a B sample confirmed the presence of testosterone and he has been provisionally suspended since. Pogba's representatives, however, said the testosterone came from a food supplement prescribed by a doctor he consulted in the United States. In tennis, Daniel Medvedev raced to victory over Alejandro Davidovich Vokina to reach the Dubai semi-finals and continue his excellent start to the year. The world number four wasted little time in wrapping up a 6-2, 6-3 win. The Russian is playing in just his second tournament of the season after reaching the Australian Open final where he suffered an agonizing defeat by Janik Sinner after leading by two sets. Reigning champion Medvedev is bidding to defend an ATP title for the first time, having won 20 trophies at tour level events in his career but all at different tournaments. Medvedev eased through the opening set with breaks in the 6th and 8th games. He powered into a 4-level lead in the 2nd and sealed victory on his first match point despite a brief rally from Davidovic Verkina, who has now lost all four of his meetings with Medvedev. Medvedev will next face Ugo Humbert in the last four. Six two, six three. Moving on to golf, Australians love to spoil the party at the New Zealand Golf Open. Nine of the past ten tournaments have been won by Australian golfers and they again appear to be lining up for a crack at the biggest share of the $2 million purse at the Millbrook. Former champion Matthew Griffin and 50-year-old Scott Hand are tied for the lead after each card at 7 under par, 64 on the slightly friendly Remarkables layout in glorious conditions yesterday. Queenstown golfer Ben Campbell is the leading Kiwi and one of eight players at 6 under. Griffin's round really got rolling when he made a 10.5-meter birdie put on the par 3 sixth and followed with a nice put on the eighth. Hand, who has 16 professional wins and tied for the 12th at Millbrook last year, went on a run of five birdies in six holes. Others within shouting distance of their leaders include 2019 Open champion Zach Murray at 5-under and two-time champion Brad Kennedy and highly rated Dave David Michaeluzzi at 4-under. Japanese golfers Tomoyasu Sugiyama and Tomohito Kurita are tied with New Zealand amateur Zach Swanwick and partner Chris Hart for the Pro AM lead at 12-under par. And that wraps up World Today. In our top story, deadly Israeli attack on Gaza aid seekers draw condemnation. Tune in to Malaysia Tonight coming up at 8.30 p.m. on TV1 and Salaran Burita RTM. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I'm Olivia Nicholas. Thanks for watching.